All right. So far in this course, we've covered some basic principles of writing in regard to the presentation of ideas. We still have two lectures to go with regard to writing. And that's going to be lectures 9 and 10, when we will take up written samples of work handed in by student volunteers. We've covered oral presentation. We had a three-lecture unit on that. And this evening, we are going to start the first of a two-lecture unit on arguing, which is the last main topic of this course. So we will conclude this topic next time. I want to give you some theory tonight and then some actual demonstrations. Now, by arguing uh, in connection with this course, I do not mean formal debate. In other words, you know, where you have an affirmative and a negative, and they give formal presentations, rebuttal, counter-rebuttal, and so on. There's, uh, that is not introduce anything new over and above methods of oral presentation that we've already covered. I mean by arguing in this context an informal process as it takes place in a drawing room, in an office, at a party, etc. A kind of unstructured back and forth exchange between two people. No speeches, no lengthy statements, just a conversation about some idea by two people who obviously disagree. Now, if this is regarded as a form or method of presenting ideas, uh, obviously it has very major drawbacks. It's not nearly so effective a method as either a formal written presentation or a formal oral presentation. Because in this kind of informal arguing, you have virtually no chance to lay down your context, or to structure and organize your presentation. For one obvious reason, the other person chronically injects his ideas just when you get started. And it's always a point that you don't want to cover right at this moment because you haven't laid the basis yet, but he raises it. You can't follow a single track. The subject changes all the time in accordance with the other person's desire to persuade you. So he keeps introducing new objections, and the thing sprawls all over the place. In addition, the other person may be antagonistic, cut you off. You may have no time to develop your point. You just launched on topic A, and suddenly you don't know how you're into topic B, and so on. So in other words, it's more or less chaos. Granting this, however, there's one thing you can say about arguing, even granted all of its drawbacks, and that is it's basically unavoidable in some form. You're going to be doing it anyway, the great majority of you, whether you really want to or not, because you will make some remark, or a person with you will make some remark, and the other one will say, I disagree, and you can innocently or naively say why, and the next thing you know, a back and forth discussion involving momentous issues is taking place. The only way that I can think of to avoid argument entirely is to remain in a completely insulated environment of people who agree with you entirely on everything substantial, which would require in this world that you withdraw from the world. Or the alternative would be you simply sanction by your silence uh, whatever you hear, however heinous. And of course, you know that according to objectivism, the proper policy is you don't have to argue with people with whom you disagree, but you should not sanction by the sheer your silence some horrendous remark. You should say that you disagree. Now, since most of you are going to some extent to engage in argument anyway, the better you do it, the better all things around. There are two general goals that you can hope to achieve by arguing. You can't actually give a good formal presentation of your viewpoint, but you can suggest to your listener a new idea or a new approach. 
the chances of converting someone in argument are minimal, not to say non-existent. To get a person to change his mind, particularly on philosophy, you need an organized presentation, he needs time to digest it, and so on, unless it's a very, very delimited question. But what you can do in argument is indicate, look, there's a new viewpoint here worth your looking into. And this is especially true if you have any onlookers. That is, if it takes place in a drawing room and there's you and Mr. X arguing and 12 people sitting around listening, you probably won't have too much success with Mr. X, but you can uh, make a suggestion to the listener. You see there's a viewpoint here that you haven't heard before. So an argument can function in effect like an ad or a trailer uh, for your uh, ideas. The second main thing that it can accomplish is internal. It's excellent practice for your own inner clarity. The more you try to answer objections, real objections raised to you in person by real people who won't be satisfied by just you giving them some obvious retort, they'll come back with another one. The more you try to do this, to answer the questions, to meet those kind of challenge, challenges, the more you will actually understand uh, your own viewpoint. Whereas the more sheltered you are in this regard, the less you know the possible objections to your viewpoint, the less you actually grasp its full logic and ramifications. And in this regard, uh, the church is entirely correct in this use of the technique of advocate of the devil, uh, that someone is not regarded as um, practiced and knowledgeable in his view until he can defend himself against someone else taking the position of uh, the devil. It is a very good technique, assuming the devil obeys some minimal rules of logic and order. And in uh, uh, arguing, your opponent is happy to provide you with uh, someone playing that part. As I say, you will find it helpful, and I quote one sentence from Ms. Rand in this regard. Quote, if you keep an active mind, you will discover, assuming that you started with common sense rationality, that every challenge you examine will strengthen your convictions, that the conscious reasoned rejection of false theories will help you to clarify and amplify the true ones, that your ideological enemies will make you invulnerable by providing countless demonstrations of their own impotence, unquote. This is taken, by the way, from an article by her called Philosophical Detection, which has a lot of good material on the subject of one of the topics we're going to discover, discuss this evening. Now, the first issue that I want to mention tonight is the topic, when to argue and when not. Now, there was when to get into a full-fledged back and forth discussion and when to refrain from it. Now there are many cases, as we'll see in a moment, where it's not appropriate. Uh, in such cases, as I say, I would expect that if it's a moral or significant issue, you could make clear that you disapprove of the person's view so that you don't leave yourself in the position that your silence or refusal to argue implies agreement, but nevertheless there are many cases where given that disclaimer by you, it makes no sense, there's no point engaging in argument. I'd summarize it like this, assuming you want to argue, now remember there's no moral duty to argue, you have to decide is it worth it, is it worth the strain, do you, want, do you think you'll do anything for your inner clarity or conversion or suggestion of a viewpoint to other people, and if you don't, I'm not saying there's a moral obligation by any means, but assuming that you're interested and want to develop along these lines, I would say, in essence, argue when you believe that your opponent, however confused, is honest. He may disagree violently with you, but the question is, is he open to reason? Is he open to argument or not? If he's dishonest, which means facts, arguments, reasoning makes no difference to him, then of course it's a waste of time. It's a waste of your breath because you're giving arguments to someone whom you believe holds the idea that arguments are, are irrelevant. And 
In addition, if you argue with such a person, you are actually sanctioning his pretense. If he wants to engage in argument with you, that means he wants to pretend that he's a man of reason, that he has arguments and so on for his view. Now, if he does that while simultaneously denying reason, he is engaged in a real fraud. And your refusal to comply uh, is uh, much more dreadful to him than any amount of refutation uh, by you. Uh, I recall when I first uh, discovered this many years ago, I was arguing with a religious person, and uh, I asked him if, at the outset of the discussion, he, we changed, exchanged a few comments back and forth, and he was eager to continue, and I asked him if um, I am able to give a case that you can't answer, will you then abandon the belief in God? And he said, no. Uh, he said to me, would you become a believer if I could prove it? And I said, yes, I certainly would. And he said to me, well, you can't prove there is no God. And I said, fine, I don't think you can prove that there, that there is one. But the question is hypothetical. If I can prove it, so that you would have to say, I simply can't refute this, will you abandon it? I'm prepared to say the same for the other side. And he said, no, I'd have to say, even if you can prove it, then I'll revert to faith. At which point I said, well, if so, what's the point of going through the pretense of arguing? You've already said that you're going to believe it on faith anyway, which means you do believe it on faith, and it's not on the grounds of reason, so why pretend? And we just sat there and looked at each other, and I wouldn't argue. I mean, it was pleasant. <laughs> and I couldn't quite figure out at the time why he was so devastated by that. <laughs>
uh, latest equivalent is, I would say that cannot be honest because honesty in this con connection means the willingness to adhere to reason and this person is openly repudiating. Now you see what I mean by explicit as opposed to implicit. The sheer fact that a person believes in God does not per se mean that he has anti-reason. I would say philosophically you could show that the advocacy of God by implication is an anti-reason view, but you have to show it. And so long as a person thinks that he can prove the existence of God as Aquinas did, he can be completely honest, even though mistaken. Even a skeptic who says you can know nothing, if he says it as part of an obvious nihilistic attempt to destroy the mind, that's one thing, and that would be dishonest, because it's then overtly anti-reason. But suppose he's got all mixed up from his philosophy classes and he doesn't know what certainty is and he's got three arguments that he thinks proves that you can't know anything. Well, granted, he's being contradictory because he claims knowledge that you can't know anything, but maybe he doesn't see the contradiction, you see. You see the difference between an explicit attack on reason versus by implication. Or another example from the aspect of content. I would say any explicit advocacy of the destruction of values. All civilized relationships depend on common values. Any viewpoint which explicitly advocates the destruction of values, I would say has to be dishonest. For instance, if a person advocates murder of innocent people, or that would not be too common, but take such a theory, which is the closest to it perhaps today, the most dramatic example, egalitarianism as advocated by uh, Professor John Rawls. Now there you have a view that says in effect if you are able by that very fact you should be cut down and made uh, incapable of living and it's stated openly. And if you are a loser, you are the standard uh, of the good. Uh, it is an open assault on values. I do not believe that can be honest because that is, a, is an actual uh, attack on values as such. Now you see how I would differentiate that, for instance, from an advocacy of welfare statism. A person could say, well, we have to have a welfare state. What's going to happen to the poor? That he can be motivated in such a case by the question of helping what he sees as a threatened uh, life, uh, human life, namely the poor or the weak. Or he could even say, I believe each of us is is his brother's keeper. He would be wrong in saying such a thing, but he would not necessarily be dishonest. The most I'd be prepared to say is he's intellectually passive, he's pretty conventional, but whether he's open to argument, you would have to see in uh, uh, discussing it with him. Whereas uh, if someone advocates the naked destruction of the able because they're able, that's a different proposition. I think in part this is a contextual issue. How much knowledge is available of the meaning of a given position at a given time? For instance, if someone advocates communism today as against in 1900. Now I wouldn't hold a brief that most people even in 1900 uh, were mo uh, motivated honestly in advocating uh, communism. But let us say a character such as Andre in We the Living the kind of idealist who doesn't know what is involved by this doctrine, would be more conceivable at that period of history than today, where you would have to say advocacy of communism in today's context amounts to murder. Now those are some examples just from the aspect of content. It has to be an explicit assault on an essential of all civilized uh, functioning before I would say you can say it's per se dishonest. Then the other criterion or guideline is the manner or method of approach of the other person. In effect, does he come across as rational or not? Does he try to answer you if you make a point or evade? Is he calm or is he screaming? Uh, does he change the subject so chronically that you can never make a point? Uh, it gets to the stage where it's as though he's trying to stop you uh, from speaking. Does he drop abuse, engage in personalities, vent hostilities, spew insults, etc.? Now, 
This, again, is not too easy to judge because in arguments people get enthusiastic, not to say heated. A certain amount of chaos, of changing subjects, of agitation, even of antagonism and anger is certainly understandable. So here you can only use this as a kind of approximate criterion when it becomes extreme, uh, consistent, and blatant. In those cases, the best thing to say is there's no use arguing uh, under these conditions, uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, I stop. I won't take part under these kind of terms. My own uh, experience, I try to say in these cases, either if I think the topic is out of bounds, such as anti-reason. I simply state my view, uh, and I say I don't regard that as open to uh, debate or discussion. Or if it's the issue of the manner, I say, I don't see how we can exchange views under these circumstances, so let's stop. Now, I would be uh, happier if I could tell you that I could carry this out uh, to the extent <laughs> that I advocate. Um, I, I do admit that it's very easy to get sucked into these things <laughs> because you, the person says something so provocative uh, that you think you can't resist <laughs> however dishonest a one line put down, and of course, <laughs> The one line put down has no effect, and he immediately comes back, and then you give one more, and the next thing you know, uh, it's out of hand altogether. I can merely say, so far as possible, if you pick your spots uh, and refuse to get involved, if you really believe the person is dishonest, you will save yourself grief and ultimately do more for your own cause by not sanctioning, you see, his dishonesty. And I, I suggest that you don't do this, though. Don't judge too easily that somebody is dishonest. There are people that I know that don't want to argue on different grounds. They're actually afraid that they're going to be demolished in the argument. But uh, instead of admitting that to themselves, that they don't know their own case too well, they take the way out of saying, um, uh, I am not going to sanction this person's dishonesty as soon as he says it's a nice day outside. Uh, that is a rationalization that you no know, one should do. If, if you don't want to argue because you don't know the case, the best thing to do is say in, in your own mind, I'm not arguing here because I really haven't the faintest idea what to say, so I'll just keep quiet. That is much healthier than to figure out why the other person is really too vicious uh, to be talked to. And then, presumably, you go home and figure out what was the answer, and the next time uh, you can get your revenge. All right, now let's suppose that you do decide to argue, and we're talking here throughout on philosophic issues because that's the concern of this course. What should you do? Well, now, since we're talking about informal argumentation, by definition, there are no fixed rules. Obviously, there are the general rules of logic, and there's all the fallacies you shouldn't commit but uh, those are broader, those apply to any form of communication, not simply arguing. I mean, I could give you a few bromides that would be completely useless, such as know your subject, remain calm, uh, be clear, answer effectively. That's obviously of no use. What I want to do is cover a few more specific issues where they're applicable. You can think of them more as issues of strategy how to manage or conduct the overall course of the argument. This is only where you're having a philosophic argument. The first thing I would suggest to you is try to discover your opponent's basic premises. This is if it's a serious philosophic discussion. Try to discover your opponent's basic premises. Now, this is what Ms. Rand calls philosophical detection. The fact that somebody takes a position on some controversial issue of the day, which is where debates and arguments usually start, from that fact you do not necessarily know from what premise he is speaking. You don't necessarily know what basic ideas he holds that leads him to this view on the controversial issue of the day. And as a matter of fact, in most cases, he himself probably doesn't know. 
if he's not philosophical. He, and in addition, he may be inconsistent. He may be contradictory. He may hold part of one philosophy and part of its opposite at the same time. But still, on the whole, usually, there is some dominant philosophic tendency or angle or orientation in the person that underlies his concrete views on specific controversial questions. And this basic approach is the crucial thing to try to discover, if possible. Now, philosophy has a structure. And this is true whether anybody knows it or not. A political viewpoint rests directly or indirectly on an ethical viewpoint. And an ethical or moral viewpoint rests ultimately on metaphysics and epistemology. Typically, a person starts arguing some political question. That's the kind of arguments that come up, wage and price controls and abortion and the draft and so on. And you find very quickly that it is fruitless to solve the discussion or the debate on that level. But if you use the right method, you can push it one step and elicit from the person his moral premises underlying his view on that question. And beyond that, his metaphysical or epistemological foundation. At that point, you reach the real issues in dispute. In other words, the real issues are usually not the one that you happen to start with. You start with some daily controversy, which is really just the tip of the iceberg. And your goal should be to try to dig out the entire berg and get an idea of what is uh, separating. Therefore, typically in an argument philosophically, you work backwards through the various branches of philosophy until you reach the foundation. At which point, you either see the person is open and in time you can resolve the basic dispute between you, or you see this person is closed or it's hopeless, it would be a life's work, and then you see the original discussion is futile also because it rests on a philosophic chasm that simply you're not going to try to resolve. Now, how to engage in this philosophic detection? Ms. Rand says many things on this with regard to the meaning of various catchphrases, and I refer to her, her article that I mentioned at the beginning this evening. But now how do you apply that in arguing with someone? The method is, in effect, to keep asking why, to pursue your uh, opponent deeper and deeper, and finally let him tell you what he's ultimately relying on. You always keep your eye on the roots of his statements. Now, let me indicate to you in pattern, it will not be as brief, as simple, or as straightforward, or as successful as the pattern I'm going to illustrate to you, because I'm just condensing the essence, but just to give you an idea. Suppose you're arguing on abortion. And someone says to you, uh, I'm against abortion because this is murder. I believe every human being has a right to life, including the fetus. And let's suppose you decide to pursue it uh, a bit. Now let's say you make two points. I'm assuming you're familiar with this material, so I'm not going to elaborate them here. But in a word, you make the one, the distinction between a potential human being and an actual human being. And you elaborate in what way a fetus is, has the capacity to become a human being, but is not yet a viable self-sustaining entity, and therefore is merely a potentiality. And therefore, it's not murder, and no rights apply. And secondly, you make the point that if he's concerned with the right to life, what about the mother's right to life? And then you explain to him the lifelong responsibility that he's imposing on her, the sacrifice of her own life and happiness to a, an unchosen obligation if she doesn't actually want the child. And if rights are his concern, uh, it should be the rights of actual human beings, not the non-rights of mere potential. So you make some speech on that order, if you're able to get out that many words before <laughs> he interrupts you 12 times, that's good. But let's suppose, just for now, you get that much in. Now here are some possible responses and how you, you see, they would indicate different kind of basic premises. Now, ideally, and sometimes this happens, but I wouldn't hold your breath, Ideally, the person will say, I never thought of that. 
Uh, now, you never will win that easily because, of course, the person will then have all sorts of follow-up questions, even if this to him is an intriguing view. He'll want to know, oh, where do you draw the line between the potential and the actual? And you'll have to know the answer to that. And uh, he'll say something like, well, uh, are you saying that a, a woman should do anything she feels like? She has no responsibility. She can just live it up. Um, those are obvious, logical follow-ups to your original point, and uh, it may indicate that the person, after all, is decent. He merely was echoing what he was told with no special vested interest, no evil basic premise motivating. But not take a different kind of response. You made the same speech, the same two points, and the person tells you, it's all a matter of semantics. I don't care you call it potential, actual, it's just words. Call it whatever you want, I call it human, the, the fetus, you see. Now that's a different kind of response. Now your first question that you have to find out is, when he says it's all a matter of semantics, is this just a thoughtless catchphrase on his part? Or does it indicate an actual viewpoint, a philosophic viewpoint? If it's a thoughtless catchphrase, you can get rid of it right away and come back again, say, okay, that's out, now let's start again. What's your answer? If it represents a basic viewpoint, then you are in business in terms of philosophic detection. Now, how will you find out which it represents? Well, tell them something like, well, look, when you say it's all a matter of semantics, uh, you apply that everywhere. For instance, if I call this table an elephant, uh, is that a matter of semantics? Can I make it into an elephant? Is there a reality or not? Is it there or not? Now, a person for whom it's just a catchphrase will say, well, no, obviously. The table is there. That's not a matter of semantics. And then he'll be a little shaken. He'll say, well, it's intangible things that are matters of semantic, not tangible. And then you just pursue him and show him it's the same principle. So he is not then, to that extent, motivated by uh, a bad fundamental, necessarily. But on the other hand, there are certainly types who will say, absolutely, you call it an elephant, it's an elephant. You call it whatever you want, it's all a matter of language, we make the world whatever we want. In other words, it indicates a fundamental rejection of reality. Now, if that's the case, and, and you pursue it a few times to make sure he really knows what he's saying, and, is, I mean, that is his actual view, or at least the view he's taking for the argument. You have traced now his view on abortion, and you've shown that he's resting on a certain basic assault on reality. And similarly, in regard to epistemology, if you wanted to pursue that line, you could tell him, uh, you know, semantics pertains to how we use words, and uh, Words are concepts, and all human knowledge is in terms of concepts. So if, if you say semantics is arbitrary, and you're saying all knowledge is arbitrary, no one, anyone's view on anything is as good as anybody else's, there is no such thing as objective truth. Is that your view? Are you a complete skeptic? Now, some people will have pause, and others will say, absolutely, I always believed that. <laughs> you can't know anything, it's all a matter of opinion, but once you have uh, you know, elicited that, you see a basic epistemological view. Uh, uh, you can ask him, well, are, do you apply that everywhere? Are all definitions arbitrary? He says yes. All value judgments arbitrary? Yes. Can anybody know anything? No. In science? No. In ethics? No. Well, at a certain point, if he, you know, is holding to this view, you've begun to get assuming this combination. The guy is against reality. He's against knowledge. He's a kind of militant uh, skeptic. Then there is no use, if that's the case, pursuing the argument uh, any further. On its own terms, there's no use. What's the use of arguing about abortion if he claims there is no reality and you can't know anything? And every view is as good as any other. I mean, on that, those kind of basis, you are never going to convert him to anything. Uh, there's no way even to deal with him because he's rejecting the precondition of all communication. <laughs> on the other hand, he might say, well, no, I don't go that far that it's, we can't know anything, and then you simply have to, you know, in a kind of innocent Socratic way, say, well, where do you draw the line? 
uh, where, where is it a matter of semantics and where is it? He'll say, well, I don't know. You said it's all a matter of semantics. So you're now retracting that. Then, of course, at some point he'll say, if he's honest, well, I never thought about that. I'll have to uh, work on it further, so to speak. But you may stimulate him, you see, and indicate that he has problems. In either <laughs> event, whether it came out happily or not, the argument about abortion has turned, and this will happen very quickly if you push it that way, into an argument on epistemology and metaphysics, and will be much more decisive whatever the ultimate outcome. If you could ever get this guy to grasp reality and reason, by the time you did that, if you could do that, and then you came back to abortion, this would be in the next century, uh, it would pass like this, there would be no problem. Uh, so you see, you would at least be arguing on the issue that actually mattered. Or one possible further response is to show you pushing it back. He might say, uh, when you say a woman has a right to pursue her own happiness, well, he might say, doesn't a woman have certain duties? Shouldn't, uh, well, you're not supposed to be selfish after all, are you? Now again, you can't jump right away. You have to decide, is that a, a catchphrase that he doesn't to grasp the meaning of, or does he really understand and mean it? And you have to try to explore, in effect, as a scientist, which is possible only if you don't feel threatened. Now, if the minute he says that, you feel, I've got to make a 20-minute speech on uh, ethics and answer everything and so on, then, and particularly if you feel, I don't know the answer, <laughs> then you can't be too scientific about your uh, process. But the ideal thing to do, if you've got an answer like this about selfishness, is give yourself the assignment to explore what does it actually come from in him. He says you have duties, so you ask him, well, uh, what duties would you say we have? Uh, these are duties regardless of anybody's choice that we're born with. What duties? And he, maybe he'll say, where, and then you can ask him, uh, well, where did these duties come from? Uh, who imposes them? Uh, why should we obey them? Just a few questions like that, not as so much as polemics, not in order to attack him so much as simply to grasp what is the actual structure of his view. Now, uh, in abortion, if that was the starting point, for instance, he might say, everybody knows our duties come from God. You're supposed to love your neighbor, including your fetus, etc. Uh, in other words, he might indicate to you a, a religious viewpoint. Now, if that were true, and he actually believes in God and faith and teachings of the Bible and so on, it would be useless to say, well, let's set that aside and just argue about abortion. Because whatever you say about potentiality or actuality or whatever, he says, I had a revelation from God that abortion is evil. Or uh, you say uh, a woman has certain rights to her body, uh, and he says, I have faith in the moral teachings of the church. So here again, if you're going to continue, you have to turn the conversation away from abortion to the questions of God, revelation, in other words, again, metaphysics and epistemology. You either have to decide, well, let's explore and argue on this level or drop the discussion. Now, you will sometimes find that your opponent is very inconsistent. For instance, as proof that an embryo is really a human being, he will say, that's God uh, has established that. As the source of man's duties, he will say society. Now, that's two different views, one pre-Kantian and one post-Kantian, but he's not, so to speak, synchronized with one overall uh, viewpoint. So he's part religious, part uh, subjectivist. Now, as soon as you see that combination in a person, you see that he's more or less grabbing at random. He's not philosophically trained. And uh, you'd have to tell him in some polite way that uh, he's all mixed up uh, <laughs> and try to organize what. Now, we won't have pursue this example further, but the general point here is that in philosophy, controversial concretes rest on basic foundations. And the only real hope in a serious argument is to work back to the fundamentals and then either argue those or else decide that it's useless. All right, now the next point. This is a point I want to make 
about fundamentals when you reach them, and assuming that you do decide to continue. And this point I will put as follows. Don't concede your opponent's premises. Don't concede your opponent's premises. Concede, C-O-N-C-E-D-E. -E. In other words, don't grant them. Now, there are many people who do, th they actually reach the basic premise, and then they concede it, either out of cowardice and appeasement, or uh, in a short-sighted attempt to win the specific argument they started with. But uh, this is a very grave error. Conceding basic premises is the attempt to show, on the other person's own terms, that he's wrong. In other words, you try to accept his basic ideas and then show that he is being inconsistent, even granted his own foundation. Now, what does this remind you of, a point that we have already covered in this course? Rationalist polemics, exactly. Uh, we, uh, the example was the paper on certainty, uh, where I conceded uh, certain premises for the sake of argument. And you saw there that I was completely lost. This, in general, is a harmful, useless technique. 99 cases out of 100, you're doomed to lose. Take the abortion example. Now, this is an example of conceding premise once you reach it. Suppose you say to the opponent, and this is very common. All right, I grant you that the mother has a duty to the unborn child. I grant you that he's the standard of value and everything else should be sacrificed to it. But on your own terms, even granted that nothing counts except the welfare of the baby, if the baby is unwanted, it won't be happy. It's going to have a miserable life. The mother won't love it, she'll resent it, she won't bring it up properly. So for the sake of the baby, on your own premise, you should have an abortion. I, I'm sure you've heard this because this is said repeatedly by people who accept the altruist ethics but are liberals and therefore they're in favor of abortion and this is the way they try to put the two uh, together. Now that argument is hopeless. That argument completely concedes the basic premise and uh, the religious advocates of uh, abortion, uh, opponents of abortion rather, wipe it out completely. Now what immediately is the obvious answer to that kind of argument if you are uh, an, an, an opponent of abortion? Yes? The baby's still better off being born. Well, you say one answer is the baby is still better off being born. That's possible, but I can think of even more powerful answers that are usually given than that at the back, yes? Well, sometimes they say what you're suggesting. If the parents are that corrupt, we'll turn the baby over to the, uh, to the state. But there are still more basic things that you can say. One, you see, you've conceded the premise that fetus is a full human being with rights. But for its own happiness, we can do away with it. Well, what is the immediate comeback then? Yes, the immediate comeback is, well, fine, you're condoning murder then. You're saying whenever a victim would be unhappy, it's okay to commit murder, which is exactly what they're saying. That they don't, the people who use this argument don't say the fetus isn't human. They concede that it is and it has rights and everything, only they're, they're altruistically concerned for the baby's welfare. Well, that's obviously ridiculous. In addition, they very often come back, the opponents of abortion, and say, well, look, if you grant that the child is the primary value and that sacrifices the noblest virtue, the mother has no business resenting the child. She jolly well better live to serve the baby whether it makes her happy or not. After all, you concede I'm right and that she owes the child a duty. She better come through to hell with what it does to her life. It's just a sacrifice and you granted that sacrifice is her duty. Uh, now you see there's no answer to that except the liberals come back and say, well, instead of sacrificing to her uh, unborn child, the mother will join the Peace Corps and sacrifice in Tanzania. That's obviously a senseless, they've lost the argument. It's, it's equivalent to the, the conservatives who try to defend capitalism by saying, well, we agree that people should live to serve the public welfare, but the fact is people don't have any incentive under socialism. 
so uh, we have to leave them free because that's human nature. Well, they concede the moral premise, you see, that the public interest comes first and the individual is a sacrificial animal, but then they say, as a means to your end, we need capitalism. And the immediate answer is, the capitalists damn well better reform. And if not, we will have special schools or camps to re-educate them. <laughs> There's no answer to that. There's no reason why that shouldn't be done if, in fact, they are serfs and simply don't recognize their moral duty. The same would be true, the same type of collapse and defeat, if you concede uh, an epistemological premise. It's true of any basic premise. Suppose you, for instance, on that abortion debate, thought you're going to be smart and you'll get him on his own terms with regard to semantics. And you say, well, if it's all a matter of semantics, then anybody's language is as good as anybody else's, and I'm going to apply the label good to abortion. So by your own statement, I can call abortion good. Now then again, you see, you're trying to argue and catch him on his own terms. And of course, his immediate answer will be what? It's good for you, it's not good for me. I don't apply the term, and there's more people in my camp than yours. Now you can't win. Once you say there is no truth, you've wiped out any viewpoint that you have. If you have any questions on this topic of conceding premises, I'll give you two horrible examples to remember which don't even need to be elaborated, just named. The Republicans in relation to the Democrats, or President Carter in relation to the Russians. Appeasement intellectually leads to just as bad results as it does politically or militarily. And therefore, I would sum up so far by saying detect the foundation, as well as you can, of your opponent. And if you disagree and, and intend to continue, challenge it head on, boldly. Don't try for a polemical advantage by accepting his premise for a moment. All right, now another general point of strategy. You see, these are not arranged in any special order. They're just sort of off-the-cuff uh, cuff, uh, ex points from years of experience. This next topic applies when you are on the receiving end. You are being peppered by all kinds of points. What to do? And you can title this one, Select the Essential Point to Answer. Select the Essential Point to answer. Which, of course, presupposes that you know what it is. Now, this comes up as follows. Typically, your opponent in a discussion will hurl many different objections at you all at the same time. Very often, in one sentence, there'll be three different objections. Now, this may be honest on his part. Perhaps he doesn't see that there's three different objections. After all, his whole viewpoint is not the same as yours. What, what is important to you is not necessarily important to him. And you get this torrent thrown at you. And he says, what do you say? Now, your desire will be, well, patiently one at a time to say, look, I mean, assuming you know the case, to say, well, look, you've made three different points. Let's take them one at a time. In most cases, that's useless because you uh, start on number one and you get through two sentences and he right away raises four new objections to the first two sentences of point one. And now you've got two points hanging over from the first statement and four more. And you don't know how long you're going to be able to hold it. You add one more sentence thinking you go back to point two and he's got another one. And then, of course, the crow epistemology sets in, and your mind just cuts out. You lost the whole thing. You don't know where you are. You don't care. You can't discuss it. <laughs> now, this is an enormously common thing. The pressure builds and builds. Uh, and this is the form of the crow epistemology in argument. Now, if you are arguing philosophically, and you're aiming to go back to fundamentals, and you do understand your own viewpoint, you'll know what to do whenever you have such a barrage directed at you. 
always choose one, the most essential issue, and restrict yourself to that. Now remember, this is an informal argument. You never signed a written paper saying, when I leave the room, everything I know about this subject has been presented in the best possible order. This is it. This is not like a formal written statement where you had time to think and edit. Therefore, if you omit to cover some point, you are not in any way implicitly left in the position of you necessarily agree with the point you didn't answer. The best thing to do is select the one most crucial out of the whole barrage, at least as best as you can tell at the moment, and then just sweepingly deny all the rest. In other words, the pattern would be like this. I don't agree with a single word that you just said, but I'm going to confine myself to point X. Now, if you do that, you leave yourself free. Then either you start on X and you get another barrage and you do the same thing again until you decide it's hopeless or you get somewhere. Or you get X and then if he's honest, he may say, why did you disagree with the rest of it? And then if you can remember, you can go back. If you choose your X correctly, it will often cover the rest of what he says anyway, because if it's an essential, a great deal will rest on it. Therefore, I'm t don't let your opponent overload you, either inadvertently or deliberately. In most cases, it's inadvertent on his part. Now, this isn't that hard to do. If you're on the radio or on TV, it's murder. Because then the pressure is really intense. Uh, as I know from some small experience in that field, you really have to concentrate because the uh, interviewer will ask some brief sentence, every word of which is a disaster. <laughs> There's masses of people listening. You have to pick on the spot. And the producer holds up the sign 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, and you haven't even got time to say, I disagree with it all because the time is going to be up. What do you challenge and what do you let go by? But in a living room, there's much less pressure. You can always go back and say, by the way, I never got to this point. Uh, it's more informal and so on. So it's not as hard, as ominous as it sounds. But still, the point is you do have to be selective. As a rule, there's more to answer than time permits. So you have to be content to restrict yourself to the essential, but you'll be surprised how often it short circuits an otherwise endless meandering discussion, because it right away goes to the heart of the disagreement, leaving aside the lesser points. Now, suppose we change the example. You're arguing the draft. And you're against it. You're in favor of a volunteer army. And let's suppose an opponent peppers you simultaneously with three objections. Now, let's suppose the three are the following. It's too expensive. You know, it'll contribute to inflation and taxes. We can't stand any more government spending. One. It's unfair to the poor because they're disproportionate in the army. And that's two. And three, it's unpatriotic. It's un-American not to offer your service to your country when uh, it's demanded. You get the three objections. It's too expensive. It's unfair to the poor, and it's unpatriotic. Now, of course, you can write an essay on every one of those three points. But if you had to choose one by a show of hands, let me see. Which of those three would you choose? If you had to say only one, you couldn't cover the other two, and the guy's going to leave the room after the one, and for the rest of his life, he'll never know your answer to the other two. <laughs> That's the way you have to figure it. Which of those three? How many would answer the issue that is too expensive? We have a couple hands. How many would answer the issue it's unfair to the poor? I have a few more hands. And how many would answer the issue it's unpatriotic? Yes, absolutely. I agree with that. That's the overwhelming majority. Now, why? Because that's the one that focuses the moral issue. That's the purely philosophic one. And the implication of saying that a volunteer army is unpatriotic is that the country has a lien or mortgage on your life, that America is the land of self-sacrifice, duty, altruism. Now, if you contest this, 
In one stroke, you are able to establish, even if only briefly, your own basic view that if man has a right to his own life and happiness, that the draft is therefore anti-American, that this was supposed to be a free country with limited government, and so on. Now, if you just get that in briefly, just enough to say, you're crazy to say this is unpatriotic. I'm the patriot. America was founded on the premise of individual rights and liberty, just that much. At that point, if you want now to go on to the discussion of is it too expensive, you've already laid the base for a quick answer. You can say, well, no, it isn't too expensive. We just have to cut out all the useless welfare and government spending programs that are based on the premise that you started with, that are the opposite of the American viewpoint. In other words, you've already indicated you don't accept altruism, so you have a quick answer to it's too expensive. And the same for it's unfair to the poor. You can very quickly say, well, of course, the poor can't get jobs today. The whole economy is frozen thanks to the government doing what you think it should be doing. But if we had an American system, uh, there'd be ample employment as there always was, you see. In other words, by challenging the one essential, you lay down your base, and thereafter, most times, you can sweep all the lesser points in the process. So for this reason, among others, it's very valuable to stick to the essentials. It'll also find, you'll also find that this helps you in detecting what the other person's foundation is because the essentials are the real issue. If the person advocates the draft, it really comes down to altruism and statism, as we've already discussed earlier. The other things that it's too expensive and unfair to the poor and so on are just rationalizations of the moment and therefore they are not really uh, the issue. Now you see the difference between that versus arguing out of the blue, it isn't too expensive. Then you have to start ag haggling over. How much are we spending? What are we spending? How much would it cost? And then he'll tell you. Well, in the latest study at university so-and-so, they said it's going to cost so-and-so much, and then we have to have rehabilitation for all the corporals and so on. And you, once you get into that desert, it's hopeless. You, you simply uh, uh, get nowhere. You're down the drain. So I would suggest this. As you listen to the other person speak, you should be reviewing kind of lightning-like. What are the things you could pick on? Now, if I'm arguing, I kind of have a monitor going as the person is speaking, and I either put it on hold a certain point and think that I should remember, or I let it go, that's not important enough, I sift it out, that's, I'll pass by, or sometimes the red light will go off and I'll think that one I'm going to answer no matter what. And that's the signal you see that it is uh, an essential. Now, of course, partly this requires experience. It's nice to have 20 years before a class of being peppered by five objections at every sentence, because after a while, by sheer accumulation, you get to know there's only so many combinations. So <laughs> you get to know which to pick. And partly, of course, it's also how you understand your views. It's, are you clear what is a philosophic essential and what is just a detail? Now, I want to make one further topic, and then we'll take a break. To reduce the pressure of all these countless points to answer, but a somewhat different topic, I want to say something about what do you do when you're confronted with facts? And I'll put that word in quotes, quote, F-A-C-T-S, unquote. In other words, alleged or dubious or blatantly senseless, unreality, anti-reality fact, but claim to be fact, which supposedly refute you. In other words, not philosophic argument, but allegedly hard, I was going to say hardcore, but uh, <laughs> hard evidence, hard data. It's usually closer to hardcore. Now, this happens most commonly in politics. Uh, these are all the alleged facts of the evils of history under, in the 19th century under capitalism, or by the anti-nuclear people and all the alleged disasters that are going to come from nuclear plants, or the anti-pollution people, etc. But it's not only by any means restricted to politics. It's now very much in vogue to cite alleged psychological studies 
For instance, you'll be arguing on abortion, and you'll talk about the mother's right to happiness, and then they'll tell you that there's been a study at uh, Purdue that uh, mothers who were forced to have children against their will had a happiness quotient 3.8 times uh, <laughs> the norm. And therefore, if it's the mother's happiness, uh, she should be forced to have the child. This is very common. <laughs> or very often, we you now hear in the last decade or so alleged facts about epistemology. For instance, ESP and clairvoyance and all the British Society for Psychical Research and all the alleged uh, factual experiments to prove mysticism. Now the question is, how do you deal with this torrent, which is highly favored by many people who do not know philosophy and think they're on solid ground if they can simply sling facts, allegedly, at you? Well, let's be thorough in our discussion of this situation. One possibility is to become omniscient. <laughs> in other words, learn the answer to every possible factual claim, true or false, that could ever be made. That would involve you in a study of werewolves, Indian rope climbing, stigmata, and a whole bunch of You'd probably have to spend five years at least mastering the literature on Three Mile Island, <laughs> etc. Now, this is, this is obviously impractical, partly because it is impossible, and partly because it is useless. Even if you knew all of those issues, these, in the great, great, great majority of cases, are not the issue that you and the other person disagree about or are arguing about. Now, let me clarify something here. I'm not against facts as such. You'd have to be against reality in that case. Facts, including facts of history, economics, psychology, are certainly important. They're important even to philosophy, because philosophy doesn't float free in another dimension. But we're talking in the narrow, specific context of arguing with other people. And in those cases, it's hard for me to give a quantity, but the great, great majority of alleged facts are completely a smokescreen, a cover-up, a rationalization as, for instance, they blatantly are in the anti-nuclear movement, where they seize on anything uh, with any plausibility or none, and then immediately switch to the next point as soon as that's answered. Faster than you can read them and refute them, they're on to the next one. And they have allegedly reputable scientists and they're stable. Some technique or method is necessary to escape complete strangulation by this kind of data. And in my experience, the single most effective thing, now it's, it's not infallible by any means, because there are people who are deaf to ideas. They can't tell an idea from a hole in the ground, and all they want is to give statistics. But they're not, and not everybody is like that. The best suggestion that I can make is learn to isolate the philosophic issue at stake from the dubious data. In other words, switch the discussion from a debate about fact to one about philosophy. Now, your opponent, in many cases, will not want to name or be unable to name uh, his ideas. And in fact, one reason that he gives you all these facts is either he wants to hide his ideas or he doesn't know he has ideas. Uh, so, uh, it's not always easy to do this. But sometimes, a person will, if you ask him, state his ideas and or you can make him do it. I've had success sometimes with this method, provoking a person into naming his ideas as follows. If you're arguing with an anti-nuclear type and uh, the question is, there is no safe method to dispose of nuclear wastes, and therefore radiation will be roasting our great-grandchildren and so on. Now, you can argue about that and tell him how many scientists have established that you could dispose of all of the wastes for I don't know how many centuries, and what is it, how many square yards or acres or whichever, but it won't make any difference because it'll just go on forever. 
a better thing to do is say, well, I like to know, we disagree on this point, but are we discussing a question of safety and that's all? Is this simply a factual dispute of the disposal of nuclear waste? Because if so, it's pretty dull. I don't agree with you, and let's just stop. But let's see if it's true that there's no dispute. And then I would say something like this. I mean, I would do it better or faster or sh slower, depending on my view of the person. But I'd say something like this. Would you agree, assuming we were able to prove that they really were safe and there was no problem of disposal, that that issue was out of the way, you would then agree that we should bend every effort as fast as possible to develop nuclear power. You'd be a passionate advocate of nuclear power in such a case. Um, you think it's a magnificent example of the kind of innovation that's possible in a capitalist system. <laughs> You're, you admire heroic human creativity as manifest in the ingenuity of this kind of achievement, man's triumph over nature, and so on. Now, if the person s uh, says, well, uh, <laughs> I guess I agree to all that, then uh, you don't have any dispute with him because there's nothing there to argue then. He's simply, you just have to give him one reference. Uh, if it's true that he really agrees with all that, he's just swallowed one stupid practical point and you can tell him, well, look it up in the library, it's not worth discussing. But in the great majority of cases, uh, that would raise a torrent of protest more or less coherent, denouncing man, capitalism, machinery, progress, the Industrial Revolution, etc. In other words, in the great majority of cases, the anti-nuclear uh, protest is merely a tactic. It's not a viewpoint. And if so, there's no use arguing forever the safety of the reactors, because even if they were safe, these types of mentality would oppose them on some other grounds, or they would simply switch to a new uh, bete noir, a new uh, uh, evil that they're going to uh, denounce. The same way that the student protesters in the 60s, for instance, would uh, swarm on Columbia University and say, we won't permit a gymnasium to be built uh, in this building. It's an outrage, it's racism, it's uh, evil against the poor, and so on. And the day that Columbia University said, all right, we won't build the gymnasium, they lost all interest, and they switched immediately to, we won't permit. Now, they're, they're obviously simply provocation as an end in itself. And the same is applicable in, in the great majority of these cases. In other words, I counsel, if you can, don't let a person conceal his real premises under the guise that it's only safety or cleanliness or whatever that he cares for. In some way, get him or provoke him into or ask him to identify his actual premises or do it for him. To, you know, I've sometimes said, well, look, as I understand it, your alleged fact is meant to support the following view. If so, let's discuss that. Uh, sometimes a person says yes. Now, assuming that that does not work, or you have to deal with facts, there's a, a few lesser points I might make in conclusion here. There are cases where, on purely philosophic grounds, you can refute uh, an alleged fact. Here, it's either philosophy or else the inner logic of the viewpoint. Now, this is not true, I underscore. It is not true by any means of all uh, wrong facts. Uh, you cannot, for instance, by philosophic means, by philosophic means, show that nuclear power is safe, or that saccharin doesn't cause cancer, or you name it. These are obviously subjects out of the special sciences, and philosophy per se cannot have a viewpoint on them. But on some issues, uh, you can call philosophy to your side. You can deny an alleged fact outright on philosophic grounds. For instance, extrasensory perception would be an example. Because as that is put forth, it is awareness of reality acquired by no means, without any physical instrumentality, without senses, 
And since the senses are the physical means which connect man to reality, extrasensory perception is effect without a cause. And that's a naked attack on cause and effect. Or from politics, for instance, if somebody tells you under capitalism there was a history of ruthless coercive monopolies, you don't have to know anything beyond the logic of the view to say, well, how could they be coercive if competition is permitted? This is less say fair. How could, the, how could they, we be forced to deal with them if any competition is free to enter? And you can simply say, if you don't know in a case like this, well, I don't happen to know the history in the case you cite. But on its own terms, why would there have been no competition? And very often the person will say, well, I don't know, that's what the facts are. And you say, well, it doesn't make any sense, I don't accept it. In other words, here you're rejecting something on philosophic grounds. This would be the equivalent of saying, uh, not that you would argue with a Nazi, but assuming that for the moment you would talk to him just to illustrate this point, if a Nazi started to hurl a whole set of uh, accusations against Jews at you, you would know blatantly that he's arguing from a racist premise, and you would reject it on those grounds. You wouldn't start saying there's no Zionist conspiracy in New York, and there also isn't one in Philadelphia. You wouldn't deign to argue on those levels. You'd reject the whole thing on purely philosophic ground. Now, there's another thing you can do with regard to uh, facts if you're forced to deal with them, alleged facts, and that is challenge their epistemological credentials. Facts do not fall from heaven. They come from somewhere. And in the typical case, they come from, quote, authorities, studies, the latest research, all historians know, etc. That's what the person will, rely, will rest them on. Now you know that science today is in a mess. Partly its political motivation on the part of many scientists is blatantly leftist. But more basically, methodology, epistemology, is in very bad shape. The arbitrary assumptions that are being passed off as science, the uh, reliance on statistics without any check as against cause and effect, the kind of blatant pragmatism which says we don't care about reality, we just want numbers that work. And you see the results of these and the kind of uh, test uh, results that they give you about saccharin or whole subjects on the order of ecology. Now, if you know this, you can always say about a fact, well, today's epistemology is so dubious that uh, where the thing is politically controversial and I have no first-hand knowledge, I do not accept any claim, period. I reject it. If you want to discuss a broader issue, fine. But if not, I simply deny it. I do not accept your authorities, your historians, your scientists, your data, your studies, period. Now, you might ask me, well, why is it OK to deny somebody's claim? Don't you have to prove that he isn't right? And no, you don't. There's a very important logical principle. It's not even distinctive to objectivism called the onus of proof principle. And it states the onus of proof is on him who asserts the positive. In other words, if somebody tells you that such and such is the case, and he merely cites a dubious modern authority, that's the same as giving you no evidence, just an arbitrary declaration. And according to the basic, a basic principle of logic, you're entitled on the onus of proof principle flatly to deny it. You can't be asked to prove a negative, and it's impossible to do so. And therefore, uh, it's in, you're entirely justified in saying, I challenge your authority, I reject that fact. Either we have a philosophic issue or I throw the whole thing out. I do this routinely, for instance, in regard to Sweden, ecology, United, um, what's, uh, unidentified flying objects, etc. I just simply say that's out. And the latest one was on the news the other day. There's some consumers group saying that coffee should be banned because a pregnant woman had many cups of coffee and the child was born with no fingers. <laughs> now, I would regard it as demeaning to investigate that question. 
Maybe she lost her fingers, but I certainly would not investigate coffee on those grounds. Now, another technique which I, I, I simply apprise you of the existence of it, I acquaint you with the existence of it in a word. I know a professor in California who has had great success with this technique. In a discussion, he simply manufactures facts out of the blue. <laughs> which are about the same value as the facts his opponents <laughs> offer. They'll say something about it's been proven how monstrous the capitalists were in the 19th century, and he'll look at them shocked and he'll say, didn't you read the Journal of Aberrant uh, <laughs> Etiology put out by the Harvard School of Nutritional Psychopistemology? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Glatzenheimer? Prove that the coefficient of honesty was 3.8 in the decade between 1860 and 1870. And they gulp. Now, it seems to me that morally, you should at a certain point indicate that you're doing that. But he says that it's surprising the extent to which uh, it puts an end to factual arguments. Now, just a concluding word on the theory here. <coughs> to become adept at argument, you need practice. Like writing or like speaking in general, arguing is a skill, an art, and it cannot be learned just theoretically. You need practice in learning how to detect your opponent's fundamentals, practice in challenging fundamentals, practice in picking up essentials, practice in dealing with dubious facts, practice in judging your opponent, deciding whether it's worth continuing. The only method that you can improve by, the only way to train yourself, as far as I know, is to do it. Plunge in and argue where the circumstances are appropriate, and then review your performance after each occurrence, in your own mind, after each argument in the privacy of your own home. Replay like a kind of mental tape of the whole encounter with you as simply an outside observer, whatever you can remember. Replay it from the perspective, what did I answer right? What did I answer wrong? Where was I unclear? What would I say differently now if I had exactly the same situation again? What am I dissatisfied with? Was there some point that I really couldn't answer and I was kind of floundering around even if my opponent never actually caught me out or didn't have the skill to trap me explicitly? Was there a question, this is very important, this particular one, was there a question I was afraid he would ask even if he didn't? In other words, you give yourself a critique of your own performance. And I, I do this still to this day after every argument, unless it's, you know, cut and dried and just file it as that's uh, 36F or whichever and that's it. I'm just kidding. There's no numbers, but it's standard. <laughs> but that's really the only way that you can uh, improve. And then I don't try to remember. I simply say, well, uh, let's say uh, I did so and so wrong. The right answer to this point is this. And from now on, if this point is raised, I'm going to take this tack, not that. And then I promptly forget about it. You just, so to speak, stalk your subconscious with that. And uh, you find that uh, next time, or a couple times later, it, it occurs to you. Another corollary method is to watch other people arguing and try to identify their flaws and virtues. If someone has asked a philosophic question, particularly if you have reason to respect them, there's a split second between the time the question is asked and the time they answer. And it's very helpful for you, very instructive to, in that split second, to say, well, what would I answer to that question? Prepare your own answer. And then, what did the person actually answer? And if it was someone who knew more than you, what could I learn from that? How could I improve? These are the only methods that I know of becoming adept at argumentation. It takes time, but I think the results help in the clarity that it engenders in your own mind. 
Now let's take a break and then I'm going to give you some actual examples which you will have a chance to evaluate after the break. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Now, by way of illustrating some of the topics that we discussed before the break, uh, we're going to have a brief mock debate. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Harry Binswanger, who is adjunct associate professor at Hunter College, professor of philosophy here in New York. He's also the editor of the Objectivist Forum. And as on TV, I said I'd give a plug, particularly because I'm in the current issue. <laughs> and I'm also uh, on the board. And uh, Professor Binswanger has generously agreed to help out and to take the position of the heavy or the devil's advocate uh, in this brief exercise. Now, we have an actual prepared script that is extemporaneously. <laughs> we have notes that we've worked out deliberately to illustrate certain types of, of um, problems. So this will not be your most spontaneous argument. You'll see us both consulting our notes as to what to say next. And I'm going to keep interrupting uh, to inject methodological comments as uh, we go on. Now, this is a, going to be a debate about free will and determinism. And we are going to assume that it started over uh, some discussion of Senator Kennedy in regard to Chappaquiddick. And uh, that's been the background of the debate. It started, in other words, on some daily political concrete, at which point uh, my opponent picks I up. I come in and I say, well, you have to understand that uh, Teddy grew up in the Kennedy family where there's a lot of pressure on a person to become president. So no matter what happened in his personal life, he would have uh, had to defend himself and deny uh, any responsibility for the wrongdoing. And uh, in short, I don't think he could have helped but do what he did, given his upbringing. Well, let me say, he already made a more plausible position for that view than he did in our dry run. <laughs> I'm going to stick to the more abbreviated version, though, <laughs> and simply say that at this point, I would seize on the general deterministic implication in his statement and say, yes, I, I, I disagree. I believe that he could help it. Human beings do have choice. They have free will. They're responsible for what they do. I don't accept such a thing as family pressure or conditioning as exonerating him. In other words, I jumped to the general philosophic issue right away. But uh, if you believe in free will, then you endorse that whole religious, mystical idea of a soul that is separate from this world and bound to a higher dimension in which uh, all kinds of irrational things occur. I think that uh, with modern science today, we come to understand that uh, a person doesn't make choices in a vacuum, as you say, and the soul uh, is something that we have to dispense with uh, due to the findings of modern science. <laughs> Don't you agree? <laughs> now, you see, this is again in parenthesis to you. Uh, you feel immediately that sense of being swamped. <laughs> He has said three different objections in this case, that uh, he's equated free will with religion. He's dragged in modern science, claimed that its free will is incompatible with science. And if you notice in passing, he said he doesn't believe in choosing in a vacuum, which implies a kind of warped view of choice, so something arbitrary and indefensible. Now, I can't begin to take all of those on at one time. So I have to, in effect, as it would, in my mind, it would go through religion, science, vacuum. He gave me three roads to fall. What would I choose? And in this case, I would choose right away which one? No, I would choose the anti-religion 
I would choose the religious one first simply because it's the religious view of cause and effect which has led to the view that science versus uh, is, uh, is an enemy of free will. And it's the religious view of cause and of, co of free, free will which has led to the view that uh, choice takes place in a vacuum. So if I repudiate the religious view, in one stroke, I will go to the essential and clear away the ground and get rid of one basic misconception of my view. Now that's my instantaneous mental reasoning, and therefore I say to him, you have me all wrong. I disagree with all of that, but the main point is I don't have anything to do with religion. When I talk about uh, free will, I don't accept the soul. I mean only man's consciousness, which I regard as a completely natural, this worldly fact. But wait a minute, what do you mean by consciousness? Which, you see, is a perfectly legitimate question on his part. And now I have to either go into an a, a dissertation on, uh, on definitions, which I don't want to do because that'll get us off the track, so I answer in a common sense way. By consciousness, I mean simply the faculty of awareness, the faculty of perception, the thing in us which thinks. And all I say is man has the power to think or not, and this is directly perceivable right now, for instance, you can listen to what I'm saying, you can direct your mind to it, or you can simply go out of focus and drift in a daze. That's perceptible to you, and I say everyone has that power, and that's free will. But if that were true, if there were free will to that extent, then that would just make hash out of psychology. You couldn't explain or predict human behavior. We'd have to throw out Freud and Skinner and all the findings of modern psychology. <laughs> and human action would be mysterious. Okay. <laughs> I don't believe any of this, but. <laughs> now, you see the advantage of smoking. When I used to smoke, this is the point at which you would light a cigarette while you're trying to figure out what's the essential. <laughs> One thing is obvious. He's now switched from what is free will to is it compatible with prediction. So I might, if I want to keep order in the discussion, say to him, well, look, you're changing the topic on me. First of all, do you agree with my, that it doesn't have anything to do with religion? But let's suppose we let him go and I don't try to change the topic. Uh, and I agree with him, let's change the topic. What then one point would I have to make to cover this issue that uh, it wrecks psychology because it makes prediction impossible? In a word, I'd have to, t yes, at the back. Not to concede his premise. Can't hear you. Not to concede his premise. Well, you say don't concede his premise. In other words, you have to be a little more specific. You'd have to say, distinguish the basic choice which you regard as free from its results. And you say you certainly believe that human actions are explicable by a science of psychology and predictable within limits of the basic choice. Given a person chooses to think, that leads to certain kind of ideas, value judgments, emotions, actions. There certainly can be a, a science of psychology. Uh, and then you throw in as your final, you see he's already getting restless and ready to answer you. But, so but, but. you just throw away as you're leaving, and you say there certainly can be a science of psychology, although of course it wouldn't be the junk that Freud puts forth. That's it. So you've dissociated yourself. Then you say that the fundamental is the choice to think. Correct. But what I want to know is what makes a person choose to think. It can't be just an accident. There has to be some... All right, now here again. You see, it's much harder to defend than to attack because he just has to state, and this is true in all these debates, he doesn't need any context. You can just throw anything that's prevalent at you, and you have to dig out of a whole mass of stuff and figure what, how are you going to lay your foundation. So uh, you have a much harder uh, approach. He says, what makes a person think, and what makes some people better thinkers than others? Well. That, that what makes a person a better thinker is already a different question. You see, that's not the same issue. So you have to say, we're not talking about better thinkers. There are reasons why some people think better and worse that pertain to their education, their ideas, and so on. We're talking about the basic choice, to think or not, regardless of how well the process is carried out. And then you have to say, what makes a person think? Well, you imply something has to make him. The whole point of free will is nothing makes him. He chooses. 
But if he chooses, there must be a cause as to why he chose what he chose. Are you saying that this is an exception to causality, that there's just an inexplicable, uh, uh, causeless event that occurs, which is focusing? Now you see he is stating explicitly what earlier he was hinting at when he said that um, um, you have to choose in a vacuum. Now he's stating openly what that view is, namely that choice is completely causeless. So you would have to give him a brief thumbnail description. In effect, you'd have to say, oh, no, I believe causality and free will are completely compatible. They're in no way at war with each other if you have the right view of cause and effect. Man's nature is the cause, the effect is the capacity to choose. Uh, you, I would say, are accepting the billiard ball view of cause and effect. That uh, if there's cause and effect, it can only be like one billiard ball from the outside striking another and making it react. Of course, on that model, there can be no free will. But causality is not restricted to that viewpoint. Well, that's interesting. I never heard that. I was assuming that uh, <laughs> the only cause and effect there could be would be a billiard ball. But you're saying, besides from that sort of billiard ball causality, there's a different kind. Well, I have to think about that. All right. Now, you see, if you get that response, which is very uncommon, <laughs> uh, obviously, that is a very good sign. And that would, should certainly intrigue your appetite to pursue this conversation further. But now let's drop off and tune in a little later in the conversation to get another aspect. Don't the facts indicate that there is environmental control over a person's development? For example, we know that a child gets his values in the socialization process from his parents. And uh, in fact, they did a study recently at Cornell. I think it was Professor Farnheiger, who, yes, it was the Laboratory for Primate Behavior, who did a very interesting study on identical twins, which found that uh, twins raised in different environments came out with different values and different personality, whereas twins raised in the same environment had uh, very much uh, the same values and personality, indicating the genetic factor is not nearly as important as we thought. And also, if you uh, are going to say that children don't have, uh, are not controlled by their environment, then you're going to say that if uh, a child is brought up with maniacal parents who say feed it LSD from age one uh, through adolescence, and uh, bring it up in some sort of crazy religious cult, that that child's going to be the same as a person brought up in a rational environment. I just can't accept that. And uh, if you just look at the facts, furthermore, I mean, really, we have to be empirical. If you look at the facts, people do tend to have the same values as those in the environment around them. And doesn't that show that the environment is the determining influence? All right, now you have to answer that. Uh, and you can barely even retain the number of different points in there. He's got factual studies, misinterpretations, uh, everything thrown at you. What do you have to do? You have to decide, running through all that, what is the essential misinterpretation of uh, the proper view of free will, which uh, is causing him to come to all those different uh, points. But now, does any, this is difficult. This is tricky. We have to work this out slowly at home, so don't uh, feel badly if you don't know. But does anybody know what type of point essentially unites all of these random uh, environmental observations? Yes? That it's either got to be environmental or heredity? Well, you say he's assuming that it either has to be environment or heredity. No, that's not correct. That's not his only assumption because, although he implied that at one point, but he's allegedly giving a lot of evidence showing, in effect, that children follow their parents and so on, and that therefore the environment does produce uh, effects on their children. And uh, how can you therefore say they're free? In other words, uh, he's pointing to the fact that a lot of uh, people conform to their environment, a terrific number do. And doesn't that show that they don't have choice? Now, what? is the assumption that he's making there. In the back, yes. There's a basic uh, confusion between influence and determination. 
All right, you can put it that way. You say there's a basic distinction between influence and determination. In other words, the environment can influence you without determining you. But if you put it that way, uh, you'll immediately want to ask the question, well, influence you against your will or not? Can it make you into something that you don't choose to be? So what you'd have to really say, it's on the order of what you're saying, but what you'd have to say here is one point you'd have to make to him is you don't understand what I mean when I say the choice to think or not. You don't really grasp that. You're assuming that everybody chooses to think. Now, that doesn't follow. All I say is they have the choice one way or the other. Of course, if they're, in other words, they're capable of being intellectually independent. It doesn't mean they're going to be. The very fact of free will leaves open whether they develop their faculties or not. It leaves open what they choose. And then, of course, if he asks, well, but why are so many unthinking on philosophic questions? You can answer simply enough. Philosophy is very complex. Uh, it takes a great uh, capacity for innovation, and most people simply are passive. But that doesn't prove they don't have the capacity to think on anything and that they don't have free will. As to this, his other point about, you'd have to say something about the LSD parent, you know, because otherwise you've left open the implication you believe that a child given LSD from the age of one nevertheless has free will. And of course, that's impossible. And what is his error there? Again, it's the same type of error not understanding the nature of free will. In this case, it's somewhat different. What is the nature of the error on this example? Sorry. Yes. Well, free will doesn't exist if the child is medicated. Yes, you, you can destroy a child's brain and thereby destroy all his rational uh, capacities. So free will does not mean unlimited omniscience or omnipotence. You can destroy a child before he's able to get off the ground. That's not the same thing as saying if he is, has a healthy brain, he has no capacity to think, you see. So you'd have to make uh, those points. And of course, you wouldn't make it in this simple, simple way because you'd get halfway through one point and he'd have two more. In any event, let's suppose that. Such as. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I agree with you that philosophy is the determining factor here, and it's very complex. The problem is that a young child is not a philosopher and is not able to uh, think logically about these issues. He absorbs them long before. A very common point, and here you can just answer straight. It's one point, so you can just answer straight and something like, if he is able to understand what they're saying, he's able on his terms to judge it. If he can't understand it, by that fact, it's just gibberish to him and he won't be influenced by it. So either way, it's not a problem. Just, I mean, you'd have to answer it on the same terms you see that he gives. Well, it seems to me from what you've presented that uh, you're talking about something that isn't really free will. You have a different uh, conception of free will than what we traditionally understand as free will. Free will is a, is a causeless, mysterious, mystical idea of uh, something that just happens in the, in the person. And you're talking about uh, a control over a person's mind. It's something very different. It's not free will at all. Well, now, there you see he is indicating, in so many words, a rejection of the basic view that I put forth. And I'd have to say, well, I made it very clear that I do not accept the religious view, which is what you are here assuming. You're assuming that free will has to be something mysterious, unscientific, uncausal, and you're just reiterating that your basic approach is coming back to the surface again. I've already repudiated that. I simply point to the facts of nature without any reference to religion or mysticism and say, look, we have minds, and you yourself can see you can use it or not at any moment, at this moment. So it's a factual question. It's nothing to do with mystery, religion, etc. Well, wait a minute. Where did you do your graduate work? <laughs> <laughs> right away, you're suspicious, you see. <laughs> New York University. Oh, well, no wonder. You studied under William Barrett, no doubt. The, uh views that you hold are reflecting his uh, existentialist kind of commitment to free will. Now I know where you're coming from. 
Now, you see, that's very convenient if you would say this at this point. Why is it convenient? I mean, as polemics, as argumentation. Because he's right away ascribing my views to my background. He's saying, you have no choice. You're just a puppet mouthing what you've been taught, as, of course, as a determinist, you would have to. And then you merely say, that must be true of you. It must be true of everybody. It must be true of determinists. Determinists, too, have no way of knowing whether their ideas are true. They're simply puppets pulled by strings that they can't control, and therefore nobody can know anything on your view, even the truth of determinism. So your view is self-refuting. It leads to complete and utter skepticism even about itself. Well, maybe we do know nothing. We only think that we know something, but actually we don't know anything. Now, are you serious about this? Well, I'm, I'm serious in the sense that one is serious in discussing philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, at that point, I would have one or two exchanges to elicit. He regards philosophy as just a game, and that would be it. Then I would end the discussion, because he doesn't take it seriously. Or, as a different ending, <laughs> If I decided he wasn't really, he didn't really regard that, and I wanted to now pursue what could his fundamental premise be, I would actually be puzzled for a moment. And I would, in effect, think aloud, and I'd say to him, well, look, here you're taking skepticism, and nobody can know anything. And you started, you were this big champion of science, <laughs> explanation, prediction, and I was the mystic that couldn't uh, have any uh, 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 rational scientific knowledge. Now, you see, that wouldn't be just polemics. I'm trying to probe what in the world, how is he going to combine being for science and against knowledge? So I ask. I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> <laughs> science deals with observables. Science doesn't deal with the ultimate truth. Science doesn't give you truth with a capital T, but it just gives you the regularities that we can observe relating the phenomena. But you were talking about real knowledge, knowledge of some ultimate reality which is beyond logic. All right, now there you have the final revelation. <laughs> what is the viewpoint that he is there articulating, which now connects everything he has been saying throughout? Mysticism specifically, two worlds, one knowable by science, but it's a superficial world in which determinism is the rule, and another one which is beyond, which is ultimate reality, but which is not knowable by reason. So he's given you one overall integrating view, and you know all of his essentials, assuming he's philosophically self-conscious. And which philosophy is that? That's Kant. That's purely Kant. At which point, you have completed your detection, and you've also completed the argument effectively, because you now know exactly where he stands. And uh, it is no longer a debate about free will, you see. We've gone back, and now you can either decide to pursue it, or you can say, I know you, that's it. <laughs> so we'll draw, we'll draw a line at this point. Thank you very much, Professor Bitz. Thank you. That is a, uh, obviously very schematic, and we are half reading our answers, but it's just to illustrate certain trends and situations. Now I'm going to ask two real people to come up uh, and uh, give us an actual few minutes sample. We're going to have two volunteers who are now up here give a brief debate on the subject of capitalism, for and against. Now, I stress that this is not rehearsed on their part, and obviously one of them is simply pretending, since they're both advocates of capitalism. But it's just an attempt to indicate the type of things that would come up in an unstructured, freewheeling uh, discussion. We'll go on for maybe 10 minutes, or pro possibly not that long, depending upon how much comes up. And I would like you to take notes in the way that you did on oral presentations, trying to judge what is good, what is bad, what is effective, what isn't, what would you do differently, what do you like, etc., and then uh, we'll uh, uh, discuss it. Now, uh, taking the defense of capitalism is uh, Mr. Bob Patterson, and uh, taking the opposition is Ms. Donald Lowry. Uh, and I will now, the conversation presumably began, one or the other of you made some remark 
say you made something indicating you were for capitalism and then it picks up you can start however you want um, ok <clears throat> May I start? Sure. Okay. Um, well, I think that uh, I'm a strong advocate of capitalism because I believe it is the only uh, moral society because it's it recognizes individual rights. Well, what about other people? I mean, individual rights. You're talking here about uh, about what can happen under monopolies. I mean, when, when uh, someone owns a business, they can just buy up other businesses and then they raise prices and then where are we? Well, in a free society, if, uh, if you are, let's see, you would be acquiring, you're talking about someone acquiring or earning property or earning um, whatever it is that they have. And if they, if they continue to, to prosper, they're prospering in a society that recognizes free trade, so they are therefore earning what they get, and if they earn it with their own uh, labor, then they deserve what, what it is they've earned. It has not been stolen because it's a free society. Well, what about the people working for them? If it wasn't for those you know, people working for them, then they wouldn't be able to make any money. So, uh, you know, they can just raise uh, or give the wage that they want to those people, and those people have to accept it. All right, well, first of all, when you have an employer and an employee, they're both trading. Uh, a man needs work done for him. He has an idea and he has, uh, he either has capital or he has um, uh, entered into an agreement where people will invest in his idea. Then he will need uh, labor to, to uh, you know, to put it into, into practice. Now, in a capitalist free society, you do not go out and, and conscript your labor with a gun. You go out and you offer people but, but in exchange. But look at unemployment right now. I mean, people just have to take jobs wherever they can get them. I mean, it's, it's so hard to find jobs. Oh, no, you don't have to do, you don't literally, you don't have to do anything <laughs> in a free society except uh, not initiate force. If... Um, so that there, you can choose to work for anyone who has work available. You don't have a right. You cannot force someone to pay you wages for doing something, but you have the right to work for anyone who will offer you a job. Well, where else are you going to get money? Where else are you going to work? If, if uh, you can't make wages enough to live on, I mean, where else are you going to find a job? So they really, really are putting a gun to your head, I, I think, there. I mean, well, that's, that is, in fact, a, uh, I, well, they're not putting a gun to your head. And that's a, the idea of finding a place to work is a, is a very strong benefit of a capitalist society because each individual or, you know, there will be many companies trying to produce goods for, for the ah, people in society. Ah, but that's what leads to depressions, you see. Because, producing goods? Yes, because there comes an overabundance of goods, you see, and then mm -hmm. there's not enough money for people to buy it, so there's depressions. That's what happens when, uh, when there's too much business. Is depressions and big business is the cause of depression. I thought we were just talking about unemployment. Now you're well, telling that, me that there are too many goods. Well, that's what happens when people are free to, to produce as much as they want. You see, government control is what, what we need. Because if we have government control, then, uh, then, then we know exactly how much can be produced by any one person, which won't lead to a depression or recession. Recession which will lead to depression. Okay. It's hard for me to come at those one at a time. Um, all right. Now, on the one hand, you're telling me that there's unemployment. On the other hand, you're telling me that there are too many goods, that the standard of living in, in a free society would be too high and people would stop producing. They would stop wanting new, better, or additional goods. Now, I have never in my life met someone who said, I no longer want anything. I do not want a better stereo. I do not want a yacht if he happens to have a rowboat. I do not want three planes if he happens to have one. It's like, a, it's like talking about some kind of utopia where all the goods that could ever be wanted by anyone are produced and now there's unemployment. Well, if there were such a situation, which it well, it, it just, no, it just no, no. doesn't happen. I don't understand I, I where you I think you could... misunderstood me. What, oh, I, what okay. I'm saying here is that, that if everybody produces as much as they want, if I own a business and I produce as much as I want, and 
a lot of other people are producing as much as they want also, that there just gets to be so, too much of one product, you know, which causes, and people then can't afford it. Some people can't afford to, to buy it. So what ends up happening is we have a depression. Well, yeah. And the only way to solve that is what happened, you know, uh, is government <clears throat> control. Okay. The nice thing about a capitalist system is that there is a market where you, if you produce something, and people want it, they will pay you for it. If you produce things and they do not want it, they will not pay uh, you for it, you will oil? lose. What about oil? No, now see, you know, they, they tell us what we have to pay. We have to buy oil for our cars. We have to have gas in order to run a car now. So the, you know, the big seven, they decide what they're going to charge for, for oil prices and we have to, to, to buy it. So what do you, I, mean, I don't understand what you're saying here. Okay, so now you're talking about the, the country in fact needs oil needs it desperately. So now you want to put the people who are providing the oil under government restrictions in their ability to produce it. Just a moment ago you were telling me that there's such a problem in capitalism because they produce too much. Now to the degree that these oil companies are left free to produce, they will continue to produce and bring new oil online if it is profitable why and at they, a price. Why did they tell us that there was no oil? They told us there was no oil at one point, and then, then they come back and they raise prices. They told us that yeah, there the was no oil. Yeah, the oil company said that they, there are no more oil reserves in there. Well, the oil companies have never said that there is no more oil in the ground. <laughs> they, there's plenty of oil, and it can be extracted at various prices depending on uh, you know, the quantity of oil that's needed and how fast it is needed. Oh, so they decide, oh, they decide what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. So it makes us suffer as society. We suffer because they, they decide they're not going to drill for oil. Well, if they decide that they're not going to, well, you have a right to do what you want to do. You have a right. The oil company has a right. If they choose to produce oil, they will produce oil. If they choose not to, they have the right not to. Other people would jump in. There's a very large capital market and if there's a profit, if and the profit will be derived by people wanting the product at a, at a price, then there will always be people who in their own self-interest will devote their labor, their capital, and their management skills to drill for oil. Well, how, I mean, do I have a choice there? How many people can open up their own oil company? I mean, I, you know, it, it takes an awful lot of money to, to be able to do that. I mean, it's controlled by only a few people. You know, a few people that, that are almost, you know, in co coercion, really, you well, know, as far as uh, prices are concerned and, and buying up, you know, all these concerns. How could I compete with someone like that? Uh, you couldn't, which is the reason you're not producing oil. It takes, <laughs> <laughs> it takes a massive amount of knowledge, a great deal of accumulation of wealth. And the people who have been producing it over a long period of time have built up the expertise, the capital. Ah, uh, but, but what if it was passed down to them by their parents? I mean, then that leaves me. I, I don't have a chance to even compete with them because they're given this money by their parents. And I mean, that's unfair advantage to, an, to another person. I see. Now you're not talking about monopolies. You're talking about should there be inheritance? Yes. <laughs> well, well, that has to do with, I mean, they, they have an unfair advantage over me. I mean, I can't, I can't. Well, in, see, in, in capitalism, you have a right to your life, to the products of your life, and to dispose of them or not dispose of them in any way you see fit. If you wish to give them to your children or to your friend, then you have the right to do it because you produced it. It is yours by right. You have earned it. Now, as long as we don't have a totalitarian state, you can do anything you want with what you've earned as long as you don't interfere with someone else. If you want to pass it on to the children, it is your right to do so because it's yours. No one can tell you that they think you should give it to person X when you want to give it to person Y. It's your life and you're free to do that. Okay, well, I, I, I can go along with that a little bit. But... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both very much. Now, uh, this is very instructive, and I think that you can get a lot out of this. Uh, I'll give you one minute uh, just to organize your thoughts. Mine are already organized, but I'll give you a second. <laughs>
the defense of the positive is much much harder in this type of format i noticed that of course in in my argument with dr ben's wagner and that is equally obvious here because the attacker can have sublime blissful irresponsibility she can simply hurl any accusation she ever heard of from any left-wing newspaper or history book without basis or whichever and he has to gulp and try to dig out the whole thing and she just gets halfway through and she hits him with another one and that of course is true whenever you're taking it's not simply that you're taking a positive view but you're taking a view here that is widely unknown and undefended and therefore you can't count on a context and you have to give a whole lecture on every point and therefore I could hear Mr. Uh, Patterson you could hear him sigh each time and, <laughs> as though his mind was saying oh that one too and, <laughs> but within that framework therefore that this is inherently unfair to one of the two parties uh, let's say who how, how you estimate the outcome understanding this uh, 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 problem. How do you think they each did? Well, I think there can be no doubt that Ms. Lowry did excellently. She, uh, <laughs> she really deserves a hand because she, uh, she not only took all the kinds of things that you would uh, hear, but she got them in appropriately. You know, every time he uh, got into mid-flight, she'd cut him down <laughs> with the next one, and then he'd just pick himself up and she would zing right in again. So uh, that was really very effectively done. It's also fun, isn't it, from that side? Because <laughs> you see how easy the other side has it. They just, they don't have to defend anything, they just toss off. Now, how do you think uh, Mr. Patterson did, given the difficulties of the situation, uh, within this framework? I give you a choice of uh, uh, extremely well, mixed, or uh, not too well. Let's put out those three. How many would say he did extremely well, given the format? A few, a sprinkling of hands. How many would say a mixed case? Of uh, the very large majority. And how many would say the negative? Again, just a small number. I think I would say a mixed case also, uh, with one or two definite problems that run throughout, that would very materially have improved your argumentation if you hadn't done it. So now we have to, you know, I hope you don't take it as discrimination, but we have to focus as a critique on you because you are the one that had the ball to carry the really difficult uh, uh, problem here. If you had to put your finger on the essential problem of uh, uh, Mr. Patterson's defense or of his approach as argumentation, what is the one problem that you would see uh, running through which would be very valuable to name clearly so that you can keep it in mind for future uh, um, arguments on any subject because there's one method here. You did a lot very well, by the way. I should preface a, a criticism by saying that on a many individual points, assuming your method, you did as well as you could within the time and under the circumstances. That is, you, you know, started to recreate your context until she attacked it again. But the point is, the approach that you were trying had a certain fatal flaw. Now, who would say what type of flaw? Um, yes. Yes, you said it exactly what uh, I wrote down here. Passive, I wrote on the top, her basics, question mark. You entirely let her set the terms. That is, the way that the debate was structured, she had carte blanche to say anything. You know, she can bring in, you exploit the workers, monopolies, uh, unemployment, depressions, uh, uh, oil, uh, and so on and so, and whichever she did, you in effect yielded. You, you gave yourself as the assignment, well, now I gotta answer that one. Well, now, that is inherently hopeless as a, as a method of argument. Why is that hopeless? Tell me in your own terms as an approach, I mean. That is, letting the other person simply say anything, and at each point saying, okay, now I have to go to that. Now, to some extent, you have to do that. To some extent, that is, this is not a lecture by, by you. 
So uh, if the other person raises an objection, you can't say, that's irrelevant, next point, because they won't acknowledge that it's irrelevant. But as far as possible, you have to try to steer the direction of it rather than let them. If you let them, what happens? They are completely disorganized. They have no overall view. And they'll just jump from point to point and hit you on the head time after time. You'll never get a chance to develop any one point. You never find out what their premises are. You never establish your premises. And therefore, it goes on and on. And the net effect is you feel demoralized because you never really made anything clear. And she feels, assuming, well, this guy's got nothing to say. There's thousands of objections to capitalism. And you know they just go on and on. And you know he has no real answers. So uh, you don't accomplish anything. Now, what could you do differently? short of giving a lecture. I'll let you suggest. Uh, yes. Um, I should have taken one of uh, possibly her first objection to capitalism and then shown her how that required the use of force. Well, you say you should have taken her first objection to capitalism, which was, if I remember, monopolies, yeah. and show how that government controls require the use of force. Well, uh, let's suppose we did that. And then she would say, well, yes, but it's force and a good cause because we have to pre prevent these uh, evil uh, monopolists from harming the, pe the people. Well, then I would try to pull that back to individual rights. Which I... You said you would try to pull it back to individual rights. Well, indicate to me how, in a word. In a word? <laughs> in a sentence, yes. In two sentences. No, I'm afraid I couldn't oh. do it. See, you would be hard pressed if you start on monopolies. Although she is well advised to start there because it's taken for granted. What, now, monopolies come under what category of discussion here? Uh, what topic within what I gave you at the beginning? That capitalism leads to monopolies is, is not a philosophic issue. That is economics, and therefore that comes under what? It comes under facts. Now, her method was really to drown you in alleged facts. Monopolies, uh, unemployment, uh, oil, etc. She stuck to the kind of journalistic newspaper things, and she didn't say much about philosophy, except every once in a while she would inject a comment about, this is unfair, this is exploitation, etc. What would have had to be your strategy as soon as you see it's this type of argument, if you want to establish your terms and not just be bombarded by one after the other forever? Then? Yes get to some point in ethics, possibly individual rights versus society. Why does society have rights? Because it's made up of individuals. Well, you say get it over to some point within ethics such as, or polity, such as individual rights versus society. But that in itself is not going to be enough, because she'll say, well, individual rights is all very fine, but what about monopolies and unemployment? And she'll have that whole arsenal. So you have to hit that on the head. And there's two ways of hitting on the head. One is each one at a time to try as you did, and then she, she has, goes on forever, you know, because by the time you get to her last one, she's got research assistants coming in with more. <laughs> so you can't do it that way. So what is an alternative way of getting rid of that? You, you do want to get it into philosophy, but you can't just say, let's discuss rights. You have to have some kind of way of undercutting her in this assault. Now, what way could you do it? Yes. Or separate um, the system that he wishes to defend from the mixed system. That's one very crucial thing. That's not the broad point, but that's one point you didn't do. He says separate the system you want to defend from today's state of affairs. Now, that's very important in arguing any political or practical topic. Everybody that's unknowledgeable thinks that by capitalism, you mean what goes on today. Therefore, they're filled with the idea, every problem of today's society is a problem of capitalism. And therefore, they feel entirely free to toss every problem of the mixed economy at you and say, what about unemployment? What about inherited wealth? What about the oil companies and the oil crisis, etc." Now, by use, without anything further, if all you do is say, well, uh, we really create jobs, and, uh, we really produce oil, and so on, she says, but you don't look at the oil crisis and look at the unemployment figures and so on. Now, you can't get it. You have to take the approach there of saying, 
everything you're saying is irrelevant. There's no use arguing on that level because you're not talking about capitalism. All your objections. And she says, what do you mean? See, you say it deliberately provocative. It has nothing to do with capitalism. She says, why? I mean, unless she's really uh, impossible, then she'll just talk. But normally, she would say, well, but why? And you say, because by capitalism, I mean, and you say, complete separation of state and economics. No government control over roads and post offices, no welfare, no et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see. Now, when she hears that, you already change the nature, because then uh, you can't ask about today's oil situation. You say, we never had an oil crisis when it was freer. We didn't have unemployment, et cetera. Therefore, all the things you're pointing out are irrelevant. Now you, you tell her, think, before you raise an objection, be sure it pertains to capitalism and not to a system which I repudiate. Now that in itself, you see, puts her in a hard spot because even that much as she has to think to herself, I can't just slop out anything. <laughs> He's put a certain distinction here. Some things apparently don't apply to capitalism. <laughs> She's got to be much more cautious now. What can she say? And if you make it strong, she's always got to wonder, is this going to be one of those points or not? Because she obviously hasn't thought it through. So she would not utter all this stuff, you see. So you would, in effect, use the wholesale approach and undercut a whole bunch of objections. Now, that wouldn't undercut all of them. But that would do one thing to get rid of a certain amount. Now, you were going to give the next part. Yes? You covered it. You covered what I wanted to say. Oh, you said I covered it. What else can you do? In effect, the way I look at it, it's like a hole has sprung uh, you know, in, a, in a dike, her arguments. And the water is just pouring through, you see. And it's up to you to plug the dike so you can get back to talking about something serious, you see. Whereas she's talking about unemployment and all these things which are completely don't get to the heart of what are the philosophic issues. So by talking about what is capitalism versus the mixed economy, you plug part of the hole. But there's still a lot left. Now, as a strategy of argument, what can you do here? Now, of course, if you want to discuss economics, if economics is your forte, Pick on any one of them and start, but that's OK. But I'm simply saying, assuming you wanted to make it philosophical, what would you do to put an end to the rest of that so you would force her onto a philosophic plane? At the back. It is, why is employment a good? What are the needs of man? Well, you're trying to uh, get her to become philosophical by, you say, ask her, why is employment a good? What are the needs of man? Your intention is, is uh, OK there. You want to put her in the position of having to take a philosophic viewpoint or to think about the philosophic aspects. But your method of approach is a little too um, abstract and unconvincing, because if she is the type that was projected by these objections, she'll say, what do you mean, why is employment a good? You got to work or you starve. So you, you won't get her into philosophy uh, by that means. Now, this type, it is, it, I, you understand I don't mean you <laughs> specifically because you were acting, but I mean the type that you represent is the kind of militantly unphilosophical, filled with all these things. And you have to stop it somehow. How are you going to do it? Yes? Try and identify the ethical principle in which capitalism. You say identify the ethical principle. Well, it uh, depends. What would you say? What, what ethical principle? Well, that's what was said over here, individualism versus collectivism. She'll say, well, individualism is all very nice, but what about? And then she'll say, you know, all these uh, crises. So you have to do something to turn this type around. Now, what can you do? The red hair on the aisle. Well, what I might have said was to turn her, turn her technique around on her and say, well, if you are advocating collectivism, what happens to Stalin? <laughs> Uh, you say, turn it on her and start on Stalin and say, <laughs> look what happened under socialism. Well, if you did it in quite in that form, she would probably say, well, I don't advocate communism. I want a mixed economy in the middle of the road, you see. But in a general way, if you're desperate, you can say, uh, well, if you think that the mixed economy is uh, so good, look at all the crises we have, thanks to the government controls and so on. You can take that tack. But that's more or less a council of desperation, because it means you don't really feel that you can defend capitalism, so you're going to let her suffer 
for a while instead of you. But and there's a better way. You can still defend capitalism. But what could you do? Yes. Could you ask by what right can you force one man to do? You could ask, by what right do you advocate force? Well, in effect, you can and should ask that, but you first have to have a preliminary because she'll say, well, it's the needs of man has to live. If the government isn't there, these uh, maniacal monopolists will take over and crush us into the ground. So uh, what's the use of talking freedom and so on is a wonderful ideal that people would start. So you, you, you have to contest it. You have to beat it down. The only way or really the best way that I know would be. When she does the first one, you could simply say, well, look, there are no monopolies under capitalism. So whatever you're talking about is not capitalism. When she gets to the next one, about uh, the workers don't have enough jobs or whichever, you already have two examples, and that's enough to draw an abstraction. And that's the point at which I would say, look, we are. We have a basic disagreement here. We may as well not argue about the details of it. None of the things that you mentioned, and 10,000 others like them, ever happened under capitalism. All of it is completely wrong. And that's just, well, let's say she's just said monopolies and unemployment. You say, capitalism never led to monopolies, never led to unemployment, never led to starving widows and orphans. And you list about eight of them in advance of her saying it. So you know, you know. She knows you know the whole thing. You say, now if you're going to argue on this kind of factual point, that's a historical question. Now we'll have to go to the history books. What history do you know? How do you know it? And what makes you think all these things happened? I say not one of them happened, and you haven't got a leg to stand on. Now as you put her on, why does she think it causes unemployment? In which year? In which industry? How many people? What were the conditions? What were the wages, et cetera? She obviously doesn't know any of that, you see. You simply make a flat denial. Now you say, let's discuss this question seriously. Capitalism is simply a system where people are left free to use their minds, produce, and trade. You tell me why anything inherent in that would lead to all these catastrophes. Tell me, what is it? And then, if you like, we'll discuss the alternative, and I'll tell you why, inherent in your definition, all those catastrophes will have to come. Now, you see, as soon as you put it that way, she is necessarily put in this position. If you can make it clear, that's OK. You're free to argue. But show me why it follows from the essence of the system, because I say it doesn't. There's no use arguing facts. If it follows logically, you can show it. As soon as she tries, you see, then you can immediately go on to philosophy. Because she says, well, for instance, she'll say, well, yes, monopolies follow because of greed. And you say, well, what's greed? Well, greed is, everybody knows what greed is. You say, I don't know what greed is, as you use it. What do you mean by greed? See, she's already on the defensive. She has to define a term. <laughs> and it's irrelevant. You're not being dishonest, you see. And she says, well, uh, Greed is getting what you want by hurting other people. And you say, you think production is possible only by hurting other people. Well, uh, you know, then, a little by little, you see, you would have to then indicate how successfully you could do it. That's a different question. It depends on your knowledge, her honesty, her interest, the length of time. The main thing you have to do, though, is that you didn't do is switch over. You didn't give yourself the assignment. Put an end to all this level of discussion, turn it to philosophy, and get my basic premises on the table. You know, like in cards, you have to get your cards on the table. You have to get out as soon as possible. I stand for complete laissez-faire. It's based on man's rights. It means the freedom of the mind, and anything else is death and destruction. That much is all. After you have that, then the other person has to worry what to do in the face of that, you see. But you never got your premises out, nor hers. See, another method would have been to ask her, why did you say this? What does it come from? What's your basis for that? And you could have maybe forced her by that means. So I would say this was an example where uh, you could have benefited from trying to more deliberately go into philosophic discussion and philosophic detection rather than uh, being on the defensive. 
Now, I, I don't want to analyze them too long. Next week, we're going to have a couple of more debates, which will go on a little longer, and we'll analyze in a little more detail. But it's getting late. Uh, I just want to illustrate one or two points by this, which I think we uh, already have. Did anyone else feel that there was something uh, crucial of a general methodological nature that they wanted to say about this particular discussion? Yes. Well, wouldn't it have been good to use examples of, of capitalism just to make the point? What he, what, should he have used examples yeah. of capitalism? Like what kind of examples? Well, for instance, you, could, you might say in re, if he had a good foundation to start with and, and he had defined the word capitalism more fully, yes. he could say, do you hear the word inventor, for instance, anymore? That's a word we don't hear yet during <laughs> Such such well, yeah, that would be possible. I, I could not, uh, I couldn't say uh, on that example, should he give examples such as you don't hear the word inventor anymore and thereby elicit the idea that the mind is the source of wealth, you mean, and that invention is draw, drying up and so on. And that it creates jobs for the And that people. that's what creates the jobs for the people. That would be a possible line. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to advise that narrow a, a suggestion uh, because there are a thousand different courses that you could take. What I would say, though, is that as it stood right here, I would not counsel giving examples. The thing was drowning in facts. And therefore, my instinct would be to make it as abstract as possible right away in order to assert my terms, in order to make it philosophical. So I would deliberately have got very abstract here simply to say, I'm not going to spend the rest of this discussion haggling over facts, you see. Um, so I wouldn't go into examples right off the bat. If in another context you wanted to elaborate that you were for capitalism uh, and you wanted to get it through this. All right, I, I don't want to take it further. There's other things we could miss, uh, we could uh, comment on, but this is enough for our purposes tonight. We are going next time to have a debate on um, religion, which will be, I think, a little more extensive, and we will uh, get a chance to analyze uh, techniques and comments more thoroughly. And also, one on epistemology, is objective knowledge uh, possible? So um, we'll have a chance to get into some substantive issues. And I think at that time, if you have any questions on either of those topics, in conjunction with them, since they're both important philosophic subjects, uh, I'll, I will entertain questions on either of those topics. So we'll help to live up to the idea that we should make, get a little philosophic content into the course over and above the methods of arguing. And thanks again to the two people who volunteered. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have some written questions. We have just a brief question period this evening, so let me look at these. I will have to ignore purely philosophic questions, again, that do not pertain to communication, of which I have had a couple. But this one can be answered simply. Is that your Toyota parked in the street with the A is A license plate? No. <laughs> what do you do if you cannot think of a response, but you know your opponent is ultimately wrong? That is a very painful situation, which I was in many, many times in the process of learning uh, philosophy and learning to argue. I was repeatedly stumped by people that would say something, and I knew that's wrong, and I didn't know why. And I never found anything to do in such a case except say, I know that's wrong, but I don't know why. <laughs> um, you can say, I don't know the answer to your argument, but I know your viewpoint is wrong for this reason. And then you can just simply attack the argument. Uh, or you can say, I'd like to think about that. I haven't heard that one before. What I would certainly do is admit it, at least to yourself. The most single important thing in becoming uh, clear in your own view and, and good at argument is to tell yourself when you don't know the answer. 
Uh, and uh, if you can't think of a response, maybe you think this guy that's saying this is such a swine that I wouldn't give him the satisfaction <laughs> of saying you stumped me. In which case, you could simply say, I don't care to continue this discussion or whichever. But in your own mind, you should say, I actually don't know the answer to that point. Uh, but I normally would say, oh, I never heard that one before. I'd have to think about it. Or else, <clears throat> I would say, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that what you're using it, what you're trying to prove by it is wrong, and here's why. Uh, there is no methodology that will save you when you don't know the answer. Um, you have to figure out the answer. You can try to get the person to take it in slow motion and say, well, I, I don't know what's wrong with it. Take it again one step at a time. Where do you start? And he'll give you a first premise, and you think on the spot, well, do I agree with that? Oh, I guess that seems OK. And what, where do you go from there? And if he'll do it, maybe you can, in the process, spot where he went wrong. But usually, you have to think about it at home, and there's no, no recourse but to uh, admit it. Now, here's one. I'm sorry to say that I still don't understand why excerpt K is an example of rationalism. That was the various attempts to prove that um, the attacks on women were really attacks on men. <coughs> and this questioner writes, the argument is all women are evil. Some men love women. Therefore, some men love evil. And all this says is if x, then y, and as such, the argument is sound. Now, this is a, is a mistake. It's an actual logical mistake. The argument that was presented that I just read is not a valid argument. That is not a syllogism. All women are evil. Some men love women. Therefore, some men love evil is a non-logical uh, argument because it has four terms in it. Women, evil, excuse me, five terms. Women, evil, men, lovers of women, and lovers of evil. And if you know uh, your Aristotelian syllogisms, you know that right away that's a fallacy, and this conclusion doesn't follow. Of course, it doesn't follow because the men may not know that the women are evil. And therefore, the fact that they love women, and even if women were evil, they wouldn't necessarily know that the women are evil, which is one of the points I made last time, or whenever we discussed this, as to why it's rationalism. Simply just drawing a conclusion out regardless of contrary fact. So this is an actual logical error. The person therefore has a middle paragraph, which I'll omit because it's based on a wrong premise, but then concludes, it just dawned on me that the above syllogism is a non sequitur, i.e. those men who love women may not love them because women are evil. Uh, is this why it's rationalism? The answer is yes, in part. The same was true of the next paragraph. In other words, it's actually not a logical argument, but it has a, the guise of being deduced while actually ignoring blatant facts to the contrary. But the main problem with this question is uh, you don't know technically what a syllogism is, because that has five terms. On choosing essentials of arguing against the draft, and the three, this is from the lecture, and the three, uh, he, he indicates uh, arguments against him where it's too expensive, it's unfair to the poor, and it's unpatriotic. Could you hone in on unfair? to get to the essential points instead of unpatriotic. And as he explained, I asked him to write this, but as he explained in, uh, when he put it uh, orally, you can still, by means of unfair, get to what is just and what is fair, and therefore take it to a broader philosophic issue. Theoretically, you could. Uh, I wouldn't say that's impossible. But I don't think it would be as easy or as obvious because it's much more tenuous to get someone to define justice. It's a much more abstract uh, issue. And he'll say something like, justice is doing what's right or what people deserve. And then you end up with a dialogue like Plato's Republic. What do they deserve? And it's a long business. And the essence of argument is brevity. And therefore, when he gives you such an opening as, this is un-American, and you have a context working for you, namely, America is the land of individual rights. That's such an opening that to ignore it and go by a circuitous route of, well, what's the definition of fair, would be impractical. Could you elaborate on what you mean by the epistemological credentials of facts? 
Well, all I meant was um, how the person knows that the fact is really so. If he claims that capitalism led to monopolies, how does he know? He wasn't there in the 19th century. So how does he validate that? Now, every, facts don't fall from the blue. You have to be able to say, how can you prove it? That's what I mean by the epistemological credentials. What method was used to validate or establish this alleged fact? Now, if you're trying to establish that capitalism led to monopolies, for instance, you'd have to define capitalism. You have to know what system you're talking about. You'd have to define monopoly. You'd have to distinguish between coercive monopoly, which is the only conceivable applicable objection, versus simply owning a larger total share of the market, but doing it by means of efficiency uh, rather than by force. And then you'd have to say, what basis do you have for believing that, um, that uh, capitalism led to monopolies? Which monopolies? And how were they able to do it under a capitalist system? If you asked him, what is the basis? It'll come down to, in actual steps, well, everybody knows that. Historians have pointed it out, etc. Then you say, which historians? On what basis? How do they know? That's the question of epistemology, you see. And at a certain point, it's going to come down to they don't define their terms. They take any dominance in the market and anybody's unsatisfied desire as a primary, and therefore they claim anything they want. And that means their method is hopeless. In general, epistemological credentials are simply the methodology by which the fact is established as so. And uh, that always has to be named. The how do you know? Uh, does anybody have one from the floor? Yes. I have a couple more written, but I have a, yes. In my very early days as a student of objectivism, I would have answered the, uh, this Lowry's attack by saying, OK, maybe there will be monopolies, maybe there will be depression, but people have rights and you can't force them. Would you comment on that? Uh, Professor Benjanger says that in his early days uh, of uh, capital, uh, capital, of uh, defending uh, capitalism, if he were confronted with an opponent who said capitalism leads to monopolies, unemployment, etc., he would have answered, "Well, maybe so, but uh, you still can't get around the fact that men have rights, and if rights leads to monopolies and uh, 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 depression, tough, in effect." Now, there's a virtue and a vice to that approach, which I have also used in desperation at a young age. <laughs> the virtue is it's morally forthright. In other words, you come, you say, I'm prepared to defend a moral premise, even if it leads to that. Now, hopefully, you would give some kind of plausibility to that by saying, maybe the, my side leads to some bad practical problems, but your side leads to mass slaughter. And if I had to choose knowing no more, I'd still rather have unemployment than Siberia, you see. Um, that was what I used to do in the old days when I didn't know what was the answer. So that's OK in, in, in a case where you want to show that you'll stand by the moral premise. But that is really an expedient, a temporary makeshift, because if it were really true, uh, at least the case for capitalism and the opponent have not very convinced because at best he thinks, well, there's a big conflict between the moral and the practical. People have to live, and on the other hand, okay, they have to be free, so I don't know how to put these two together. And even the advocate of capitalism can't put the two together. And you see, then he's really ripe the next day or the next month to think to himself, well, maybe the best thing is to take a little from each system. Enough from capitalism to keep freedom, and enough from uh, uh, socialism to keep employment, so we should have a mixed economy. And that's where a lot of people come to those uh, conclusions. But I would say that if worst comes to worst, I would defend the moral premise if I had to choose, rather than uh, um, give up. But ideally, you could uh, do both. Uh, and I think one helpful way is when I, well, helpful to me is when I got to the point of thinking, ask them, why does it lead to unemployment? 
because very few people have any idea why capitalism would lead to unemployment. Of course, it doesn't, and therefore it's very hard for them <laughs> to, to answer. They just say, well, look around you. And you say, well, so what? This isn't capitalism. We're talking about capitalism. And I've seen real puzzlement on people's face of, what in the world would you say in answer to that? So I prefer that as a tag. Did uh, somebody else have a question? Yes? Well, I'd like for the moment to keep it on this subject. Uh, I have a one here, which is very elegantly worded. During the last session, you used the term true fact. Was this intentional, or would you agree that the expression is a tautology, redundancy, and pleonasm? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too good an expression, yes. <laughs> True fact is not English, so if I did say that, that's very unfortunate. <laughs> a fact, if you're going to be really exact about it, is a metaphysical term, pertains to that which is. True is an epistemological term, it pertains to the mind's recognition of that which is. It applies to concepts and conceptual statements, not to reality or facts, and therefore true fact is a complete mixture of uh, of uh, categories. And consequently, it's more than a tautology or redundancy. You make it sound as though it's superfluous. It would be superfluous if I said it's a factual fact, because there's no other kind. But a true fact is actually two different sciences mashed together, so it's a hopeless statement. Um, so if I said it inadvertently, that's the price you pay for extemporaneous uh, presentation. Now, there is one long question here on art which I don't want to read because it's fairly lengthy, but it amounts to the claim that Rodin's figures are not uh, examples of romanticism, as was claimed by the speaker on romanticism sometime earlier. And it's quite a convincing argument as it's presented, and uh, the author makes a reference to Metaphysics in Marble by Marianne Suries. I can't remember that was published in the Objectives. Did that discuss Rodin? Uh, because um, this is obviously far outside the province of this course, but for the record, if whoever is interested in that might look that up, I, I passed that by completely because there was a detail in regard to the discussion of art. But if I do remember correctly, that this is a valid point, uh, but I don't want to start exploring that now. Now I have time for one more. Did you want to ask it on something else? Yes. Yes, I gave a speech on sanctioning the last session. Yes. Well, I'm sorry you were disappointed. Just to repeat, the uh, lady was disappointed because she gave a talk last time on sanction of the victim, and the criticism was primarily on the content rather than on the method of speaking. Uh, the only answer I can give to that is that there was not a great deal to say on the method since you were forthright and clear uh, in the face of an insuperable, overwhelming objection, namely the content being basically wrong. And consequently, it's very hard to think if this were the right content, was it presented correctly because there was not very much content in it? And uh, from that point of view, it's a little difficult to answer. So I'd have to defend the procedure of the class of focusing primarily on the content in that particular case. But as I remember, in delivery, you were forthright, you were clear, and you were organized so far as I could say that within the frame of that content. But I'd need to have more content developed more abstractions covered before I could see how you could handle abstractions and whether there are broader methodological points. There wasn't enough there because of the essential error for me to be able to judge. So I'd have to leave it at that point. Thank you very much. We'll continue next time.